state of believing, in a state of submission. And in these blessed sacred days of Dhul Hijjah, we ask Allah Ta'ala to honor us to be amongst those who return to Him in a state with Him Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala pleased with us. And with that, my dear brothers and sisters, we say Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuh. Uh, in our weekly Sira program, we've had the opportunity in our very first session to review the importance of studying the life of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. We spent some time remembering and revisiting what it means to be followers and lovers of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to recognize its importance and to recognize that without his guidance without him as our role models we are a people who are in every way shape and form we are lost and allah ta'ala highlights to us that the prophet ﷺ himself was in a state of loss and confusion until allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him guidance and we found you lost and we we guided you to tell us that even the best of creation Without guidance, the nicest of people, the most upright of creation, without the sharia of la ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, is a servant that is missing an integral part of who they are and a road map to life. Even he, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, without this deen, without the sharia, was in a state of loss. What then do we say about ourselves? What then do we say about our communities? What do we say about a world that is void of the guidance of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Then in our second session, we explored the landscape of Arabia. We talked about the reality of Arabia and we particularly drew parallels to the world of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and our world today. And what we realized is that in many regards, our worlds are actually quite similar. And in desperate need of guidance today, in the same way that our world was in desperate need of guidance 1400 years ago with the gift of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the same way that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a gift 1400 years ago, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam remains a gift today. And our world is just as much in need of his guidance sallallahu alayhi wa sallam today as it was 1400 years ago. Then, in our third session, we talked about uh, the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we specifically spoke about uh, the, the lineage of the Prophet Alaihi uh, Wasallam leading up to uh, the, uh, his father and particularly the journeys of his grandfather Abdul Muttalib including his own upbringing and the stories uh, that, that involved him including uh, the facing of Abraha and so on and so forth. And we highlighted this to highlight that really there were prerequisites to the coming of the Prophet of Allah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared the Prophet of Allah for humanity and Allah prepared the world for the Prophet of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave irhasat or divine indications, extraordinary occurrences that indicated of the coming of the Prophet of Allah and they were in many regards meant to serve as, as an indication particularly for Ahlul Kitab but for all of humanity at that time to showcase to us all that there was something really extraordinary that was coming and it was of course going to be the coming of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Uh, And all of those things are important. The, the story of Abraha, the, uh, the digging of the well of Zamzam by his grandfather, uh, the, uh, the situation which the father of the Prophet wasalam, Abdullah needed to be uh, slaughtered uh, and, and, uh, and, and a sacrifice was made instead. All of these things are things that we covered. And one of the things that we try to do in this class is we try to extract lessons from all of those things. So this is not just a historic revisit, but instead this is us taking history and bringing it into our life. And this is something that alhamdulillah we have been uh, able to do. And then in the fourth session, and again I'm, I'm not very good with numbers, but in the session after that we talked about the birth of the Prophet 
and we highlighted the uh, the blessed the blessing of his birth sallallahu alaihi wasallam the upbringing of the prophet of allah sallallahu alaihi wa sahbihi wasallam and in the last session we spoke even more so about his miraculous birth and his upbringing what it was like for him sallallahu alaihi wasallam to be raised by halima and the circumstances surrounding that and lessons that we extracted from that that are relevant to our own lives and one of the things that we highlighted is that if that was the baraka of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sahbi wa sallam when he was just a baby then what do we imagine his baraka to have been after his prophethood what then do we imagine his baraka to have been at the end of his life what then do we imagine his baraka to be like today 1400 years later with millions of, of, of followers and believers attesting to his greatness and sending salawat upon him his baraka sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not restricted to his life but rather it was tied to his sunnah and so the way that we latch on to and we do ta'alluq bi barakati an-nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam is in fact not by his life not by his physicality not even by his stories but rather it is through his sunnah and through his seerah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam and this is a good news for us because that means that we and our children and our great grandchildren have in many regards an accessibility to the baraka of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a way that many before us did not in a way that many before us did not and we ask allah ta'ala to make us from those who benefit from the blessings of the best of creation rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam this is and then we we spoke about the youth of the prophet alayhi salatu was salam and we highlighted uh, the fact that he sallallahu alayhi wasallam lived in the household of his uncle abu talib and we mentioned that he dealt with poverty and he dealt with aloneness and he dealt with uh, preserving his own integrity and his own dignity and we even talked about him sallallahu alayhi wasallam dealing with the very uh, similar youth challenges of today that alcohol was a problem substance use and substance abuse was a very big problem that music and partying and clubbing was a problem and that peer pressure was very very real and that immorality and indecency was very common to the extent that immorality and indecency was seen to be the norm and that he sallallahu alaihi wasallam remained above all of that and we affiliated it with the hadith of the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam in which he sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wasallam informs us bada al islam gharibah wa sayud gharibah fatuba lil ghuraba that this deen started as something strange and unique and distinct and distinguished and it will return to being all of those things and so and so glad tidings are for those who choose to be strangers and this was the youth of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we talked about uh, in fact the very famous uh, uh, narration that tells us of him traveling with his uncle and he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very young at that time and this was the first time that that the word muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the word rasul were in the same sentence the first time that the word rasul and muhammad were in the first sentence uh sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wasallam was in the in the statement of the monk in which he said what who what is his name and who is he and he said i think that muhammad may be a messenger of allah this was the first time that it was that it was mentioned and this is to let us know that this was not something foreign to the people of the book that they were in many regards both the christians and the jews at that time in anticipation of a prophet and a messenger but they all had their own whims and fancies as to what they thought the prophet and messenger would be like and given that he didn't meet their criteria not the criteria of allah but since he wasn't from amongst them he didn't call to what they called to that they actually were resistant of the prophethood and messenger messengership not because of who he was but because of who he wasn't and many times we struggle with elements of islam and we deflect and avoid elements of islam as a reflection of our own internal turmoil 
similar to the, to the Ahl al-Kitab, that because of our preferences, because of our societal expectations, because of our uh, fall or, or problematic prioritization, that because of that we misprioritize parts of the deen because of what we misprioritize in our own lives and giving things awlawiyya that do not deserve awlawiyya. All of this, as always, as a recap, right, of what we've covered uh, so far. And even that, I haven't given it uh, uh, a full justice of what we've covered. One of, uh, one of my aqidah teachers, immediately after the, the recap, we do a tangent, mashallah, so beneficial. One of my aqidah teachers, he would begin every one of his classes like this. And it was my least favorite thing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like every class, you're going to, by the end of, by the, end of the, the last session, half of class at least was spent in a recap. And he said, repeat to me what I, what I said. And by Allah's, by Allah's fadl alone, I was able to remember maybe 70% of what he said. He said, imagine if I didn't do this, you wouldn't remember 20% of what I said. Right? And, so, and so really the goal of the recapping is inshallah ta'ala that we develop a sense of appreciation and a level and, and to learn what we highlighted in the very first session that we are visiting Sira, some of us for the 50th time in our life, maybe the 10th time in our life. But the intent is not only to learn information that we once didn't know. And this inshallah ta'ala is happening and will continue to happen. But instead, it is to highlight that the intent of this is in fact to be knowledge seekers. And qalabul ilm is not so much about gaining information that you did not know, as much as it is to change the way that you engage with what you already know. To change the way that you interact with knowledge that you already possess. And what better uh, format to practice that than with the seerah of Sayyid al-Anam salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi And we mention in almost every session a statement of some of the of the, the, the Sahaba radwanullahi ta'ala alayhim ajma'in in which they say that we taught our children the seerah like we taught them surah al-Quran. We taught them the seerah like we taught them chapters of the Quran. How do you learn chapters of the Quran? You learn them, you memorize them, you review them, and then you re-review them. You never stop visiting them. Because as soon as you stop visiting them, you lose touch with them. That is the way that we interact with, uh, with, the, uh, with the sunnah of, uh, and the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Now in the early adulthood of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa there was a lot of social unrest. And there was a social unrest that was, again subhanAllah, very similar to what we witness today and I'm using the word social unrest as opposed to political unrest because the term political unrest will immediately make it feel like it is irrelevant to us and what the Prophet ﷺ demonstrated to us so beautifully is that social relevant social unrest is typically the result of spiritual corruption social unrest in any of its forms is typically the result of spiritual corruption. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ played an active role in addressing social concerns, like the, uh, like the challenges that were existing between the many tribes, like the issues that were taking place between many of the men of his own tribe. So there was like within the tribe, there was internal turmoil. Then between tribes, there was larger scale turmoil. Then between the people of Mecca and the Bedouins, there was turmoil. So it was such a, a volatile and tumultuous time because at every level of society, they were dealing with turmoil upon turmoil upon turmoil. And I'm reading your faces. Some of you are like, man, that sounds about my life right now, right? Where we have issues between us and our spouses. And then we have issues between us as a, as, as, a, as a parent unit and our children. And then we have issues between us and our own familial units, right? And then we have societal issues, community issues, Muslim intra-faith issues. And then we have larger scale global issues. And the Prophet ﷺ in his early adulthood 
was dealing with a situation very similarly where there was a lot of tension in his own family surrounding matters of wealth and inheritance, right? Between his uncles, his imam and his extended family. And at the same time, he وسلم, was dealing with the people of Mecca and the tribes of Mecca going against each other. And then you had the people of Mecca getting into scuffles and problems in their trades while they were traveling for trade with many of the tribes externally. When we see a society that has no spiritual tranquility at any level, at any level, this is a warning of a level of ghafla that has seeped into every level of the community. And this is usually an indication that we are on the outskirts of some type of tajdeed, some type of spiritual rejuvenation or replenishment. When you see this, the scholars say, and remember what we mentioned, that in an authentic hadith of the Prophet wasalam, that every hundred years that they will be a type of a type of spiritual awakening, a type of spiritual awakening. There are so many different interpretations of that. Some interpret it to be one single individual. Some people interpret it to be one band of people. Some people interpret it to be a revival of the sunnah. Yani, and, and, and all of these, and, and, and actually the strongest opinion is that it isn't any single one of these. That perhaps in one case it could be a single individual like Al-Imam Al-Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi wa al-jami' or like uh, Shaykh Al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahmahullah ta'ala or one of the other scholars. And it may be that it is a band of people, right, that, that, that engaged in it together. But ala kulli hal, that when we find in, in any situation, when we find that there is this uh, volatile and this great sense of turmoil at every level, that this is an indication that the world is in such a state of loss that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to bring someone or something to bring them back, right? And so this is when there was uh, 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 the, the, the war that broke out between uh, the Quraysh and many of the tribes external to Quraysh. And, the, and, and, uh, and, and one of the indications that they were at such a spiritual devastation was that it happened in Al-Ashhur Al-Hurum, which was a very, very, very big deal. Because remember, the people of Quraysh were idol worshippers, but they had athar of iman. They had like remnants of, of, of iman and remnants that they were the descendants of prophets. And one of the things is that they kept sacred is the Kaaba. Remember, we talked about that last time. Uh, and the other thing that they kept sacred was the sacred months. And so the fact that they were able to actually engage in an all-out war, almost quite literally at the beginning of Al-Ashhur Al-Hurum or the sacred months, gives us an idea of how lost of a society they were. And it is worth noting that we, as we sit here in this blessed hour, are in fact in a very, very sacred time. And one of the things that we like to do about sacred time, during sacred times is that we like to always remember that in these times, good deeds are what? Good deeds are multiplied, right? This is something we love to say. What we don't love to say, which is true by the vast majority of scholars, is that particularly in Al-Ashhur Al-Hurum, and it's more contested amongst the scholars with more of a legitimate or, or a more uh, uh, deepened disagreement with regards to Ramadan, but in Al-Ashhur Al-Hurum Bidhat, there is a strong uh, concept amongst Ahl Al-Ilm, Rahmatullahi Ala al jamia that in Al-Ashhur Al-Hurum, that just as good deeds are magnified, that actually sins are also magnified and amplified. Nasallah as salam wal May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. That in these months, the sin that you did outside of Al-Ashhur Al-Hurum would be uh, uh, would, be, would be greater and more severe in the eyes of Allah than they were here. And this is an important note that while we are working to pray more in these days, to engage in ta'a more in these days, that it is particularly important in these days that we, uh, especially in Al-Ashhur Al-Hurum, uh, is that we stay away from sin. To the extent that some of the scholars say that staying away from sin in Al-Ashhur Al-Hurum is a greater priority 
than engaging in righteous acts. Why? Because if you give someone a gift, but you punch them while you're giving them a gift, right? وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلِ الْأَعْلَى And Allah is above all examples. Then the value of your gift is less measurable because there's just so much hurt and pain and concern in the harm that is being caused. So similarly, uh, if, if you are choosing between abandoning sin or doing good deeds, which you should never be choosing between the two, but if we are prioritizing one over the other, then let it be that we are equally focused on abandoning sin and bad habits in these days in the same way that we are, if not greater, then we are focused on engaging in good deeds. And as Al-Imam Al-Ghazali highlights, he says the reality is that these two things, Right, doing good and preventing evil are like, are like, uh, are like, uh, uh, they they have a level of interdependency, right? They complement each other. Abandoning sin leads to doing more good actions, and doing good more doing more good actions leads to abandoning sins. So in reality, we are in need of both of them. Wallahu taala alam. All of this to say that they broke out into war, and one of the things that we highlight is that. When people are willing to spill blood, when people are willing to spill blood, what that really means is that they've already, what, when people are willing to spill blood without any purpose, without any intent, without any measurability, what that really means is, is that they've already been able to slash souls. People are on, only ready to harm bodies when they've already grown comfortable to hurting souls. And I highlight that because when we live in a world in which we witness things like the genocide of our brothers and sisters in Gaza and the devastation and the heartbreak of what we see in Sudan and the things that we've seen happen to our, our Uyghur brothers and sisters and our Burmese brothers and sisters, my dear brothers and sisters, what this really tells us, and we should never normalize these tragedies, is that there are, uh, and I'm not trying to sound like a conspiracy theorist by any means, but there are individuals behind the scenes that have been attacking souls and removing the arwah of the ibad, removing the, uh, and, 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 and humiliating and devastating the souls of the believers far before there were people that had the audacity to shed blood. And it is only because the souls have been attacked that the Islamic morality and the Islamic ideology and the Islamic belief systems have been attacked internally and externally for so long that it has become okay. And the world is able to be silent at the witnessing of something that should have never been normal in the first place. Because the soul needs to be injured in order for it to become in a spiritual paralysis. Right? One could describe our ummah today in a state of spiritual paralysis. And this spiritual paralysis is one that allows us globally and as a Muslim ummah to witness things that are absolutely just unacceptable. And, and, and I don't have a vast enough vocab to describe to you how problematic the things are we are witnessing. But because we're paralyzed, is there a response? There's barely a response. Because we are in this state of spiritual uh, paralysis, Nasallah Salam al Afiyah, and so very similarly, uh, that is the world. However, the bright side of it is, is that sometimes we need to reach a peak, and I'm, I promise you this is not a gloom and doom talk by any means, but sometimes we need to reach that place where even the person that is in the deepest of slumbers and a community that is completely in ghafla is shaken at their core so deeply that even though they are like in this battle that took place, this battle that they faced lasted for 15 or 20 years. Imagine 15 or 20 years of bloodshed. 15 or 20 years of bloodshed. And yet after 15 to 20 years, there was enough of a, 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 a shaking and a trembling that even without Islam, they were ready they were ready for a level of, they were ready for a level of, of spiritual awakening and spiritual uprising. And that initially happened through their humanity being revived and their humanity was revived because at some point of time you just look around at the devastation and you witness the harm 
and all you can attest to is that there is a need of relief and there is a need of recovery. And so Alhamdulillah, even in the early adulthood of the Prophet wasalam, they witnessed the tribes coming together and they took a, an allegiance uh, together to have a dutifulness to anyone that was being oppressed, whether they were from their tribe or whether they were from outside of their tribe. And why did I sit on this as long as I did? Because my dear brothers and sisters, the Prophet والسلام, he explained that this was more valuable to him than any amount of wealth on this earth. This treaty that was for all intents and purposes between a bunch of kuffar and a bunch of idol worshippers was more valuable to him than any material wealth. And so when people say there's no value to civic engagement and I am the greatest critic or I am not the greatest critic but I have my own share of criticisms of these kind of formalities and very surface level interactions but he sallallahu alayhi wasallam highlighted to us that a, 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 a servant of Allah that has the best interest of the community must be socially engaged, must be socially aware, and must be, and this is going to feel uncomfortable, socially disturbed by some of the realities of the community that they are in. We must be, disur we must be disturbed by the uh, discrimination against our black brothers and sisters. We must be disturbed by the challenges that our Latino brothers and sisters face. We must be disturbed by the discrimination that people of all backgrounds are facing and the economic disparity of, of women compensation versus men compensation. We must be disturbed by these things, not because we are a woke community driven by liberal principles, but because we are a society that's moral compass is la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And so we must be equally awake, equally aware, equally if not more disturbed, and we must be equally engaged in rectifying the ills of society. And that's how the Prophet والسلام, won the hearts of the Sahaba Radwanullahi Ta'ala alayhim ajma'een by being a justice ambassador for all of those who were oppressed. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, even after Islam, if I was called to something like the allegiance or the agreement of Hilf al-Fulul, that I would be the first to sign it. Rather, in one narration, he said, I would be the one to initiate it and I would be the one to campaign for it to be agreed upon. So this is again an indication of the Prophet ﷺ and his, uh, his engagement with society. Before Islam having a problem with the forms of slavery, the types of financial corruption, the riba, the indecency that he sallallahu alayhi wasallam advocated against these things far before, uh, far before his prophethood sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa showing to us that our spiritual state and our social state are interconnected. Then the Prophet wasallam, we can talk a little bit about his, uh, his business life. And what we can say is that he sallallahu alayhi wasallam began to travel for trade before his prophethood on behalf of his uncle and even as his own man. Even just as his own man, he sallallahu alayhi wasallam began to be a tradesman. Given him being an orphan sallallahu alayhi wa the type of tradesman that he was is that he usually traded the wealth of others, which is a big deal because it's a testament to what? How trustworthy he was. And how hard work, some people they're born into poverty and they're like, listen, I can never succeed in business. I don't have the capital, the baseline to start the business. And so they just, you know, feed off of the society around them. He sallallahu alayhi wasallam earned so much credibility that even though he was not born into financial affluence in the way that most or many businessmen of Mecca did, many businessmen in Mecca, typically just to give you a, a kind of a breakdown, Many businessmen of Mecca were businessmen or business people because they were the children of business people or the spouses of business people, including who? Including Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha inherited wealth from her family, including her spouse, her previous spouses, 
And then on the premise of that, she built the financial empire that she came from. So very normally, the main business people of Mecca were people that inherited a lot of wealth. And after they inherited a lot of wealth, they did a lot of business with it. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a type of risk that Allah gave people. But as a testament to him, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and how hardworking he was, he was at the caliber of being known as a businessman and known as a credible and a reliable businessman at the same level as those that inherited a lot of wealth and, and, and were su significantly successful with it, even though he did not inherit wealth like them. Why? Because he had something that they didn't have. He had a credibility that they did not have. And so he reached their status, not by being the same as them, but by in fact being better than them in other regards. Does that make sense? This is important. Because a lot of times in society, we see the greats of our society. We say, I can't be like them. I wasn't born into wealth. I didn't have parents that were as nice as theirs. Or I, I, I wasn't born in the same country as them, right? These types of statements that we make. And so I can never be like them. Maybe there are areas that you can never be like them, but you can still reach their status, not by having exactly what they have, but instead having something else that they don't have. So he, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, reached the peak of credibility as a businessman on the premise of not his wealth, but on the premise of his trustworthiness, number one, and on the, on the premise of his effectivity, of being a successful businessman, right? And this is, this is something worth noting about him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To the extent that no one did, you know, you know like Google reviews? You know when you look at reviews, like you'll see that there's like 500 reviews, and then it's like a 4.3, and like most of it is like uh, super good. But then if, even if there's just like 4.3, is pretty decent, honestly. But if you get enough of those one-star reviews, right, then you're like, man, like this, this place maybe is not the place to take my spouse for dinner, right? The Prophet ﷺ historically did not have a single person that did business with him except that they praised him. Even his a'da, even his enemies could not attack the business integrity and dignity of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. How insane is that? Right? Like, like you, can, you can call your own siblings and they may advise your friends not to do business with you. But the Prophet ﷺ, his family, his community, his, his enemies could not speak against the uprightness and the successful nature of the Prophet ﷺ as a business partner. And this is a testament of the greatness of the Prophet ﷺ. And so he traveled a lot, and he traveled to Asham, and he traveled to other areas of Arabia, uh, engaging in, in business. And one of the things that is that he became so popular in doing that business, that he sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, uh, again, not only did it for, initially he did it for his uncle, then after he did it for his uncle, he began to do almost like a consultant. Then after he did it for a consultant, he, as a consultant, he became known to carry caravans representing multiple other people. And one of the people that wanted to invest in the caravan of the Prophet ﷺ was in fact Sayyida Khadija Radwanullahi Ta'ala Alayha. And she did so initially uh, because of the credibility that he earned and the popularity that he had gained. But given her own success as a businesswoman, she did not do so easily. Instead, she sent an ambassador with him to represent her interests and to observe the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Alayhi And this is one of those times when he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was just doing his thing, being an upright businessman, being very effective, being uh, uh, very ethical in his interactions. And he sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam did so to the extent that the reports came again, there were multiple narrations, again and again and again to uh, Khadija uh, radiallahu ta'ala anha 
that uh, that, uh, that 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 he sallallahu alaihi wasallam was someone uh, that uh, is worth doing business with. There's a few things that we can attest to. Number one is, if you are a successful individual in your prime years, find people who, similarly to the Prophet wasallam, are aware of their divine gifts and invest in them. Because the only thing worth investing in more than money is investing in people. And when you invest in people, even if you are investing money into people, the outcome of what happens when you invest in people will always be multifolds greater than investing in money. And, and imagine just for a second if Abu Talib did not invest in the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Of course, he's the Prophet of Allah and he's an orphan and Allah will take care of his people always. But number one, he invested in him by adopting him. Then he invested in him by making sure that he was being taken care of. Then he invested in him by encouraging him to become a shepherd. Then he invested in him by bringing him along on business part, just as a helper. Just as a helper, just carry the stuff, take care of the animals. Then he invested in him by sending him as or bringing him along as a business partner. Then he invested in him and having him go and be his representative as a businessman. Then he invested in him by promoting him as a business consultant until he, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, became one of the most credible businessmen of all of Mecca. All because of someone that observed him, someone that believed in him, someone that invested in him. So some of us here are young people that want to be invested in, and you're loving the speech, Right, And some of us are older people that have the capacity to invest in someone But we may be so consumed in our own life that we're not recognizing the people that should be invested in And it's not just financial investment Maybe it's investing in people, teaching them skills Teaching them human interaction skills, social skills uh, you know, Teaching them from your lived experiences, being vulnerable Telling them what worked You have a young person that's looking to get married Give them advice on what they should look for and what they should not look for, but invest in people. Invest in people. Right? We mentioned uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Al A'zam, Rahimahullah Ta'ala Radi An. He was a businessman too, right? And he was on his way to the marketplace, right? And as he was on his way to the, to the marketplace, he was, on his, uh, he was on his way and he ran into a scholar by the name of Ash Shabi. One of them is on his way to his work, the other one is on his way to his work. One of them is a businessman, the other one is a trade, is a scholar. Imam al shabi is one of the greatest scholars of his time. And he looks at him and he says, where are you going? He says, I'm going to, 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 uh, to develop wealth, to like earn money, basically. I'm going to the marketplace. He says, why don't I tell you about a marketplace that you never go and invest in except that you walk out with gains. Imam al-Shaabi is just walking to work. He's just going to work just like, uh, just like Imam Abu Hanifa is going to work. Just a young Nu'man. Young Nu'man is going to work. And, uh, and Nu'man is like maybe 15 years old, 17 years old. It said he's in his, in his youthful years. But in fact, back then... If someone was older than 11 years old and they were not invested in knowledge seeking, they already missed the window of becoming a alim jaleed. Because the likes of Imam al-Shafi'i were becoming a hafiz of the Quran by how old? Three years old, Imam al-Shafi'i is hafiz li kitabillah, right? Where like our three-year-olds, if they say alif bata, just alif bata, we say, we, we throw them a party. We call it the alif bata party, right? Now, Imam Shafi'i, three years old, and he is, and he's, he's memorized the whole Quran. So if, if, if Nu'man, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, is 17 years old, Imam Shafi'i could very well be like, hey, this guy, his prime has passed as a talib ilm. But he's walking to me, he's like, where are you going? He said, I'm going to the marketplace. Imam Shafi'i is like, I'm going to the marketplace too, but I'm going to the marketplace that never do you invest in it except that you gain. There's no loss. So what marketplace is, place is that? He says, I'm going to halaqat of ilm. That every time you go there, you invest your time, you always walk out a winner. A seed was planted in, in, uh, in Nu'man, in uh, Imam Abu Hanifa. He said, from that day forward, I knew that I wanted to be a scholar. Look at that investment. What was the investment of Imam al-Shabi? 
What was the investment? The investment of a single conversation on his way to work with one young man. That's the investment. And so similarly, we learn uh, to invest uh, the way that Abu Talib invested in the Prophet And not only did it come out in the benefit in a financial element, but it also led to, of course, Khadija becoming interested in the Prophet And we know, of course, the famous story uh, that Khadija sent her helper uh, with the Prophet and he, uh, he uh, gave her good feedback to the extent uh, that she informed her friend, uh, which was uh, Nafisa, uh, and, uh, and Nafisa began to feel out with the Messenger of Allah if he was open to the topic of marriage. Uh, and this is all to tell us, subhanAllah, even for the Prophet of Allah, it's all arzaq. It's all arzaq. It's all divine pro provisions. The Prophet ﷺ, when he began to do business, little did he ever imagine that he would one day be doing business for, all, for, 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 the, for, the, for the big shots of Mecca, let alone that he would be doing it for Khadija. Little did he imagine that he would one day become the spouse of, of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. But this is, this is a very fascinating narration that actually shows us that many of our cultural norms have no place in our tradition, which is that um, Khadija expressed her interest in the Messenger of Allah to her friend. Her friend went and felt it out with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa The Prophet wasalam, thought about it. He responded to the friend. He then went to his own uncle and... And, uh, and, and then the Prophet ﷺ and his uncles went and asked for Khadija. And I'm missing some of the details, but I'm trying to highlight something specifically. Don't think, and forgive me, this is going to offend you, right? I think I offend you guys on average three times per session. Don't think that your daughters and sons will get married in a way that's more noble than the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. They're not, they're not going to get married in a way more dignified than the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. Uh, and, and I say that because there is not a week of my life in recent time that goes by where I don't talk to a sister who's 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31 plus, except that she says she's still waiting at home for Prince Charming to come and ask for her hand in marriage. وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قوت إلا بالله. And Prince Charming is... He, he came at 21, he came at 22, and now the picture of Prince Charming is changing. Before he had long hair, now he has less hair. Before he was six foot and taller, and now he's... I remember a brother told me he walked into a house. Before the parents asked him his name, they said, what kind of doctor are you? He said, I am an engineer. They said, "Salam alaikum. And he walked out. Wallahi, I, I don't make this, I know this brother personally. <laughs> the, the, the conversation began as that. And I say that because the Prophet ﷺ was a genuinely incredible human being. And Khadija ta'ala saw that. She was a very upright and decent and dignified woman. And she was older than him وسلم, No matter the opinion you take of her age, Generally, she was older than him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, even if it is just by one year. And she went and she informed her friend. Her friend informed the Messenger of Allah. The Prophet wasallam, showed general interest, but a concern surrounding his ability to provide for her at her level. You just have to see all of the, all of the reasons why this would not happen in our world today. And then you have the Prophet wasallam, going to his own uncle, his own uncle. His uncle did not say, how dare you think of a woman like this? His uncle went with his other uncle, Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Abu Talib and Hamza went, and they with full karama, with full honor, with full dignity, went and asked for the hand of a woman that had, that had been married twice before, that had children twice before. Is this something that we would bring into our homes? Is this something that we would do? And they married 
the Prophet ﷺ married Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. And from that, uh, they began uh, their beautiful family. And yani, there's so many beautiful things. Uh, there's a, be- a statement I don't want to miss out on, uh, which is the, the, the Abu Talib, uh, he gave a speech at the wedding of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, praise be to Allah who made us of Ibrahim's offspring and the progeny and descendants of Ismail. And he gave us the custody of his house and the governance of his sacred area in Mecca. He gave us a house in which pilgrimage is performed, a safe sanctuary, and made us leaders of our people. Look at what he says now. He says, My nephew, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, sallallahu wa sallam alayhi, is not weighed against a person, but that he outweighs him in nobility, honor, and intellect, so that if wealth is lacking, money is but a passing shadow and a transient matter. Look at the speech he gave. Muhammad is one whose affinity is known. And he is asking for your daughter Khadija's hand in marriage. And by God, he is bound for a future of greatness and glory. That was the talab. He even named, look at this transparency. He even said, he outweighs, people, he outweighs everyone in nobility, honor, intellect, all of these things. Wherever he may be lacking in wealth, money is just a shadow that passes. And it's something that doesn't stay. And he is someone who is bound for greatness and glory. And he's come to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage. And still they offered uh, a significant amount of gold as his dowry, uh, to, uh, as, as the dowry of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. And they married. And this is, again, a testament of the greatness of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Of course, the Prophet ﷺ was blessed with many children uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from Khadija uh, radiallahu ta'ala anha. And he had children uh, from previous, she had children from previous marriages that in fact live in the prophetic home prior to Islam, even before he's a prophet. He has his wife's uh, he has stepchildren living in his home And you talk about blended families You talk about blended families The Prophet ﷺ is marrying Khadija She says, I already have two kids I have already have two, three kids Prophet ﷺ says, that's great Because I've already adopted my cousin Ali And I'm raising him myself and, Because my uncle's struggling And I also have Zayd who I'm treating like my son And Zayd was known as what? Zayd ibn Muhammad until the Prophet ﷺ was commanded by Allah to call him what? By his father's name, Zayd ibn Haritha. And it was then that he uh, was no longer called Zayd ibn Muhammad, right? And so they had a, a, a full blended family where he had dependents. He had Iyal, yani, two people that he was responsible for. And she had dependents, her own blood children, stepchildren, they had a full blended family before they had their own shared biological children. Look at the unorthodox home of the Messenger of Allah, the unconventional home of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we think that we need picture perfect families. You can tell that I do a lot of counseling surrounding this topic because of how, uh, how much. Just today, Wallahi, 31 year old sister, 31 year old sister. Uh, Full career, full life, fully dutiful to, to her family, and still just praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for a husband. But because of, yani, this is just, this is every day. If you say today is an anomaly, yesterday. If you say day before, right? But maybe it's, it's, uh, it's uh, best that I uh, keep my shakawa to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that I complain to Allah about these matters. The Prophet ﷺ was blessed with, uh, with, uh, with a total of six children from Sayyida Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha that were shared between them. Uh, the first of them is Al-Qasim and he died before Islam. And then the Prophet ﷺ also had Zainab and Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum and Fatima and Abdullah. 
Uh, and, uh, and, and, and what's worth noting is that each of these children of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have a beautiful story and have a role in his life but that to all of them he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was an incredible father and inshallah ta'ala as we continue the story we will begin to highlight the fatherhood of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the type of engaged and active and hands-on father that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was. So what we'll do now is for the sake of time, we'll stop here insha'Allah ta'ala, and we'll open up the floor for uh, some questions, and we will uh, begin to wrap up. Naturally, I, uh, well, I, this is the best we've done so far in going through the notes. So we're getting better, alhamdulillah, if you're getting concerned. We were supposed to cover the building of the Kaaba, which happened prior to the prophethood of the Prophet ﷺ. And so we'll talk about that next time. And we will actually, inshaAllah ta'ala, speak about uh, the, uh, the bi'tha, or the beginning of prophethood, uh, how, it all, how it all began. Uh, and so we will continue uh, with that, the building of the Kaaba, inshaAllah ta'ala, next time. Uh, and the family life, three things next time. Uh, the family life of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, and with his children, like him as a father, him as a husband, what we know of him. Uh, and um, we will also talk about the building of the Kaaba and the Prophet's instrumental role in that. And then we'll talk about the Bi'tha or the, the Prophethood, the Nubuwa, the Risala of the Prophet of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahibi Wa Sallam. We will formally end here. Hada Wallahu Ta'ala A'la Wa A'lam. If I said anything good, it is from Allah Ta'ala alone. And if I said anything problematic, which I likely did, then it is from myself and shaitan. And I ask Allah Ta'ala to forgive me, and I ask you to forgive me as well. Uh, please, uh, any questions that you may have? Yes, my brother. Mm. Jamil, yeah, it's it's a that that is a a um, I I so so to rephrase the question, he says invest typically means like uh, input and output, right? Essentially, you invest. However, the awliya of Allah have taught us that investing ma indakum yanfadu wa ma indallahi baq, right? What you what you have is what expires, and what. Uh, uh, what what st uh, what stays with Allah is is what what actually stays, and what that tells us is that when we invest in things in the ukhrawi currency, there's two currencies. There's the currency of the dunya and there's the currency of the akhirah. We're talking about currency of the akhirah, right? And and that is the currency that matters most. There's no inflation, right? There's not there's none of this nonsense. It, it, it is one that doesn't expire. And so when we invest in people. There is the possibility that there is a dunya benefit for us. And there's nothing wrong with it having a slight financial uh, uh, ben benefit to us. To us. But, but, but yes, exactly. That the defaulted investment in, that we're talking about is one that you fully are removing the person from the equation and, uh, and you're fully uh, expecting it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, I mean, this opens a can of worms that we will get to in, a, in, in some of our upcoming sessions, which is one of the reasons why heartbreak is so common is because we have mismanaged expectations of the dunya and mismanaged expectations of its creation. But when you remove expectations in the dunya and its people, you're only appropriately, you're only appropriately placing them in Allah, which is where they should have been in the first place. And it actually allows you to have a qalbin salim, a sound heart. Why? Because you're no longer carrying strife with people because you don't expect all that much from them. Right? And so it makes it easier to be on good terms with people. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Yes, my brother. Right. Alayhi Right. Right. 
Yeah, so I think the question is in reference to like the vices, of the evils of society and the Prophet was protected from them, right? He wasn't protected in a way where he was unaware of them, and this is important to highlight. He was protected in a sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, prevented him from falling into them. Remember we said there's two types of sitr, two types of veiling or protection, right? Just highlighting that because I think it's worth noting. Uh, uh, and... Uh, and, and so there is a need to be aware of the ills of society. Not to experiment with the ills of society, but to have an accurate pulse on them. The other thing that we can say is that in Arabic we have a statement, الْوِقَايَةُ خَيْرُ مِنَ الْعِلَاجِ Prevention is better than treatment. So preventative measures that eliminate to the best of our ability from falling into evil practices is always going to be a safer place to be than recovery and damage control. And many of us find ourselves needing to, like we're like firefighters in like Northern California. You put out a wildfire, then it starts back up. At some point in time, you're just like, man, like this, this feels ma laha fa'ida, right? Like there's no benefit to this. Of course, we do believe that there's fa'ida because we are mukallaf, we're obligated to put out those fires. But ultimately, what, you're better, what, you're, what is equally important to do is to eliminate the things that's causing the fire in the first place. Not in a super uh, black and white type of way, which is like you just live under a rock, but in a way where if there are windows towards fitna, that you close those windows towards fitna, and you work with your children and your dependents on skills development, of how they can utilize them as tools and not as weapons against themselves. And that takes a lot, a lot, a lot of work, number one. And what it requires more than work is tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And that's where the dua portion that you highlighted comes in, which is of course, right? Ibrahim alayhi salam is building the Kaaba. Ibrahim alayhi salam is building the Kaaba. What, what is the dua he makes? I've been thinking about this a lot. What is the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam when he's building the Kaaba? Rabbi ja'alni muqeem as-salati wa min dhurriyyati. Oh Allah, make me from those who establish prayer. He's the Khalil of Allah. He says, Oh Allah, make me from those who establish prayer. Oh Allah, make my children from those who establish prayer. And he is the Khalil of Allah and his children are prophets of Allah. But it tells us to never stop making dua for the hidayah, the guidance, and the istiqama, the uprightedness, right? The sirat al-mustaqim, the, the straight path of our children. And so we combine between those three things. Preventative measures, skills development, right? And dua, those three things. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. I'm sorry? Which class? Am I going to teach a skills development class? Uh, I'm, I'm afraid to do so before. I mean, inshallah ta'ala, we will. But I think I, I need to be a parent for longer. Uh, because theory is easy and practice is something else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless and preserve our children. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them and guide us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow them to be the coolness of our eyes in this dunya. And that's why we always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, do not try us with our children or with our families. It's, it's a big bala, right? Uh, and, and so yes, inshallah ta'ala, we will offer courses and classes on this in the future, bi'nillahi ta'ala. Musahaba, right? Be the friend, right? Like Ibrahim alayhi salam shows that he's a friend of Ismail. He says, Allah commanded me uh, uh, to slaughter you. Fanlur madha tara. See what you think. See what you think. Like look at that, like, almost like that camaraderie. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed me in my dream that I needed to, to slaughter you. Right? Like, w see what you think I should do about this command of Allah. Th that sounds like, like a, a, like a, not like a top-down dynamic. That seems like a, we're, we're trying to get to Jannah together type of dynamic, right? It's a very beautiful thing. Even Yaqub alayhi salam and Yusuf alayhi salam. Yusuf salam was so tight with his dad, so close with his dad, that he was talking to his dad about his dreams. Yani, kids today and many of our families, they're not, they're not ready to talk about their realities with their parents, let alone their dreams. Yani, so so, so like, think about how 
how laid back it was where he's like, man, this is the, this is the dream that I saw. And his dad was, was, was humble enough to not be like, you know what my dream, is, my dream is? My dream is that you work enough to make money so that I can stop running this farm. You're talking about your dream. Let's talk about my dream. That's not, Yaqub listened to his dream. He validated the dream. He understood the dream. He interpreted the dream. And then he advised based off of the dream. That's, that's musahaba. That's the, the companionship that you highlight. Uh, we don't want to go too long. Too many tangents and soapbox talks today. Uh, uh, in these blessed days of the Hijjah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our good actions. We beg of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to honor us with Hajj al Qulub, the Hajj or the pilgrimage of the hearts. We beg of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify our hearts. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to heal our marriages. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure those who are sick. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless those who are single with spouses that are righteous. We ask Allah Jalla Jalalu to grant them with beautiful and healthy and righteous offspring. We ask Allah Ta'ala to not make this world our greatest concern. We beg of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to make our greatest concern who we are with Him. We beg of Allah Ta'ala to make our best hours our final hours. And we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to allow us to receive our book of deeds in our right hand. And that we are granted the company of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wa sallallahu wa barak alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wa jazakumullahu anna khayra. And insha'Allah Ta'ala we will continue next week on Monday. Wait a second. That's not Eid, is it? I'm excited for Eid, as you can tell. When is Eid? Eid is Sunday. The second day of Eid, inshallah ta'ala. Maybe what we can do is if you all are comfortable, maybe we can... Uh, I wish I had like a group with you all. Uh, I don't want to say that too loud because I don't want another WhatsApp group. Uh, but I was going to say that perhaps we can like do dinner together or something like that. Next time, inshallah ta'ala, bring your friends and we'll, we'll host you all. Let me just say that. We'll host you all. Don't come like you're going to go to like a steakhouse, but come hungry, inshallah ta'ala, and we'll host something. It'll be a Eid celebration, inshallah ta'ala. How does that sound? Does that sound good for everyone? Inshallah ta'ala. Wa jazakumullahu anna khairah.